Stream, uh, Doug Paget here. I am super uh, excited about today, and uh, partly because you're all watching and because you're listening. And so good to see you, and as the old joke goes around here, good to be seen by you and good to be heard by you. So thanks for being with us. You can see that we have a, a collection of guests, a, a professor of religion and two filmmakers and a Vote Common Good host. I mean, who could, who could ask for a better Thursday morning? <laughs> see, on Thursdays around here at Vote Common Good, we turn our daily podcast to certain issues and topics that we think really matter in the world that we live in. And we're always trying to bring this hopeful, open-eyed um, view toward the world and asking the question, what's going on in our world and what can we do about it and how can we engage? And the issue of the environment, it's a really big issue. So if you wonder what we're talking about today, uh, the, the Butler film documentary film crew of whom Catherine and Janine are, are the principals put together a documentary with, with Curtis Schaefer on how did religion and how did religious people, especially religious leaders move against the environment when it seems like something that to many of us and me as a, as a pastor and as an activist in religion and civic life, you just sort of ask yourself like who's against the environment and why would people be arguing against <laughs> environmentalism? Well, we're going to get to the bottom of that, uh, that question and talk a bit about that today. So, uh, Catherine, Janine, Curtis, thanks, thanks for being uh, on with us this morning so bright and early. Well, why don't you tell us a, a little sure. bit, just give us a little recap of who you are, what you do, how you, how you live in the world. Curtis, would you, mind, uh, would you mind going first? Sure. Yeah, my name's Curtis Schaefer, and I teach at the University of Virginia, where I've worked as a professor for 16 years. And in my day job, I'm a student and teacher of Tibetan Buddhism and the religions of Asia. I tend to be high in the mountains so when I'm over in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, I also run something called the Religion, Race, and Democracy Lab, which looks at the intersection of racism, the history of racism, and contemporary politics, both here in the U.S. and around the world. And it's in this context that I got to know uh, uh, Janine and Catherine Butler, and we ended up making this film together. Mm. Well, uh, good morning. And it looks like for those who are able to watch this, uh, that, that you're into guitars and music too. So the background for those mm -hmm. just on the podcast is you've got a collection of guitars and recording equipment. So you have a musical That's mind, right. huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure somebody else has a room like this out there too. I'm sure they do. <laughs> hey, Catherine, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning from California. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, you know, I can just briefly say that I have had an enormous pleasure producing documentaries with my sister mm -hmm. for almost 20 years together and apart. And we've traveled the world and helped tell stories that were kind of bridge building stories that hope is always a thread mm -hmm. that runs through it. Um, trying to to gather as many diverse voices in a community to um, look at old things in a new way. And um, it was a pleasure working with Curtis and his team at the lab. It was really fun when they came to us to, and said, you know, what about doing a film like this? We had met them over Amer um, through our first film uh, that we met him on was American Heretics, mm -hmm. Politics of the Gospel, where we met Doug in Telluride. And um, it's just brought a tremendous group of people into our orbit that have been really anxious to share their stories and and ask us to help them tell theirs. So that's a little bit about me. Well, I'll tell you, it's fun for me. I like both of you personally, but, you know, I'm a big fan of documentary filmmakers, like so many people are. You people are magic and uh, and actually have made COVID <laughs> survivable from a uh, like learning and entertainment side. So so thanks for all that. And Janine, uh, you're you're part of the sister duo that makes these great films. Yes, um, I am. So, so it's kind of everything Catherine just said. Mm -hmm. um, we've been at it. We've been at it for a while. And I like the fact that you call documentary filmmakers magic. I mean, it's we think sometimes it's a little more like, you know, the sausage making. You don't want to see what goes on <laughs> behind the scenes. <laughs> so it's good to hear magic. Um, and as Catherine said, we met Curtis and his team at at UVA in the Religion, Race, and Democracy Lab through American Heretic Screening, I guess last year maybe. And so when they came back around with this subject, we were so excited by their approach to being open to kind of 
looking at this very in-depth subject, which could have gone a lot of different ways. You know, we you know we we could have we could have stayed very focused on just one one aspect for 20 minutes, and 20 minutes was a push for sure. Um, but it, it, you know, their team was was kind of excited and open to the possibility of hitting on a few different things that interact between environmental issues, religion, race, and politics. So that maybe it's a launching point to talk about um, for, for people to go in in depth and learn more about it and look at this issue in a new way. And we really learned a lot um, about the influences that have been cooking uh, around the issues of the environment for decades and decades and decades, all kind of under our nose in our lifetime, and how um, influential some of the events have been in shaping policies that we're all living with today. And I think now, even even now, it's like I can go forward in a more informed way just by being able to dig into these topics. So for mm -hmm. that, we thank UVA and Curtis and his team. Well, I, I am so uh, excited that we get to talk about this, all, all of it, because these issues that you've raised are, are incredibly important, that the world we live in didn't just happen, right? The world we live in is not mm -hmm. following just a natural set of evolutionary forces. Mm -hmm. It's people making decisions and choices and doing particular things. And this 20-minute documentary on the role of Christian faith, especially Christian faith leaders in the United States and how environmentalism became an anti-approach to to that issue is is really fascinating so I, i'm so glad we get to talk about it and i just want to remind people if they're if they're following along on on uh, our podcast that there's a video version of all of this so if you're a podcast listener i want you to know that over at vote common good on facebook you can follow us and if those of you are watching on facebook have thought you know what i want to do i want to watch this on my phone on twitter well we also broadcast all of these all of these live on twitter and uh, we even are over at twitch so if twitch is a thing you're into because mm -hmm. you're a gamer uh, I, I i don't know all three of you if you know mm -hmm. about twitch but twitch is an entire other arena of uh, video connection that people are into and we we also stream over on instagram and we do it on youtube and if if you're at all willing to go to YouTube, go to the Vote Common Good channel at youtube.com slash C slash Vote Common Good and subscribe to our channel. It really helps. Like YouTube is built around subscriptions. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really benefits us. So if you're willing to subscribe to our podcast and, and live stream over there, we'd love to have you do that. And of course, um, also, if you're listening to this, subscribe to the podcast because that also is something that really helps us when that happens. And when you do, you're going to find out that on Mondays, we talk about news updates. We call it Common Good News on Mondays. And on Tuesdays, we turn our attention to politics. Rob Ryerson and I talk with politicians and people in the faith spaces about how politics can be about the common good and not just about our political partisan separations. On Wednesdays, we turn our attention to faith. And Laura Truax, Stephanie Spaulding, and Dominique Gilliard and I host a conversation around the particular implications of faith for the common good in the world that we live in. Thursdays, we talk about uh, particular issues. And on Fridays, we turn our attention to science with an astrophysicist who's the co-host. So a lot of things happening in our world, and we'd love to have all of you feel like you uh, can connect to it and that you can be uh, part of it with, with all the rest of us. So, all right, well, let's get into this, this fun topic for the, for the day. Uh, I had a chance to watch this film. Um, thank you for sending your email out, promoting it, and uh, I was thrilled. Uh, big fan of your other work, American Heretics, which I'm sure we can talk about as we go. Um, but this film really kind of captured my, my imagination, and um, it's called God and Green. And someone had the clever idea to use the dollar sign as the and ampersand sign. So I think that's fantastic. It's, so if you're able to watch this on the video, you can see that they have created this graphic that really says there's some connection between dollars and the environment and religion. And uh, what you describe it as is the story of how potent forces came together to mount an army of climate change skeptics in the name of God, country, and capitalism. I mean, well done, y'all. Very compelling. And it's, <laughs> it, it kind of gets at this thing that so many of us thought was happening, right? Like, is there some sort of a of a intentional approach to saying to people of Christian faith in America, you should oppose 
climate and you should oppose the environment and you should be on the other side of this political issue and uh, and and you all get right at it. so I, i'll play the the little teaser that's the first uh, minute of the of the documentary and i think it'll give people a really good uh, a really good flavor of this is a story about today that started yesterday and impacts tomorrow. Hi, I'm Nancy Pelosi, lifelong Democrat and Speaker of the House. And I'm Newt Gingrich, lifelong Republican, and I used to be Speaker. We don't always see eye to eye. But we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. Together, we can do this. We couldn't be further apart. I'm on the left. And I'm usually right. And we strongly disagree. Except on one issue. Tell them what it is, Reverend Pat. That would be our planet. Taking care of it is extremely important. We all need to work together, liberals and conservatives. All right, so the whole thing starts out with this... Um, <laughs> like walk down memory lane i i remembered after watching this video uh this documentary i remember those commercials like this campaign where it was you know nancy pelosi and newt gingrich sitting on a bench saying we all care about the environment let's come together and and then of course you you know were smart enough to include al sharpton and pat robertson and so were they in the campaign when they were pushing this idea they said you know what we have to include religious people so let's get public political religious figures and let them say we disagree on a lot, but we're together on this. There was a movement at one time, or at least a, a marketing campaign, if not a movement, to, to make this possible. What, um, t t tell me a little bit about what happened. Who, who wants to sort of do the quick, I don't want you to ruin the documentary, people should watch it, but what happened? Like, how did this come about? Um. I, all I'll say to that is if you're going to keep watching, do like a little like dot, dot, dot. And then, <laughs> and then how did they go from actually agreeing on this to being polar opposites mm -hmm. for, for, for years and years and years. And, and that's a little bit of what the short goes into. It's like, what, what were the causes that happened? And there are many, there are many. So it goes from, 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 from science denial to, um, political partisanship to uh, uh, fossil fuel um, companies having a long arm in history, back in history, in terms of shaping the conversation. That's my bit. Curtis, Catherine? Curtis, you, you uh, working sure. at the, you know, as a professor of religion at the University of Virginia, you had particular interest in this and apparently pitched this, this notion and idea like, hey, we should tell this part of the story. Why did you want to tell that part of the story? And, and what is the recap of the story as, as you tell it to people, you know, when you're at a cocktail party, if we, well, people did such things we, anymore? So I, I have a lifetime in religious studies, and so I, I'm fortunate to get the chance to see how impactful religion, both as a system of ideas and practices, but also a, a culture and a real driver of social life can really influence everything in our daily lives right regardless of whether we're affiliated with the church or a particular tradition or not um, you know everything from what we eat to what we watch to you know, how we interact with other people um, and so we spent a lot of time asking ourselves at the religion race and democracy lab how religion impacts uh, our current political conversations in particular and we knew that religion was a big part of the story um, of how public perceptions of climate change um, have transformed over the past uh, two decades. And we also knew that money, <laughs> uh, uh, that big business was a huge part of it, too. So we were reading uh, a, a book called Merchants of Doubt by an mm. historian of science, Naomi Oreskes. There's also a wonderful documentary of the same name. Uh, called Merchants, Merchants of Doubt. Of it's doubt. That's Merchants a great of phrase. Doubt, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the story of, um, of how the, the smoking industry destabilized uh, uh, mm. public trust 
in emerging science about the negative effects of smoking on health, not mm. just lung health, but 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 all manner of uh, of health issues. And it was a concerted attempt uh, over a couple of decades that th this happened earlier than the climate change issue. But it was so effective the way that they y utilized um, fringe science uh, and sowed doubt in mm. public perceptions of the um, both the ways that science works and also the, the, the claims that science makes. Uh, that the people in the um, uh, climate denial world, they really took their playbook from that. And so we wanted that to be a part of that story as like, well. Like, is that, uh, is that something well. you've been able to document that those, the same organizers who moved against climate and became climate deniers, did they really, well, like, it's what, not is the it same, just sort of like the they same acted people. the same way or, yeah, yeah okay. That's what it's I'm acted the same way. Yeah. It just was so effective. Right. Um, so, you know, science doubt, um, there's a real sense in which, um, it was the the tobacco industry that really created that as um, a, a political strategy um, wow. to sow doubt. Uh, yeah, so now I'm I, sure I, we can I find other places where it's used, Tim. Well, you know. well, yeah, and I think this is a really interesting part of the conversation because you know we're now living in this period where a lot of us are concerned about mm -hmm. conspiracy theories, right? Whether it be QAnon or any mm -hmm. of the other dangerous ones mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. lead to people believing that there's some big cabal of powerful forces coming together in the background that you don't see. And then they describe how people are being impacted by that and then give people a charge um, that can lead to real dangerous actions like an insurrection at the Capitol or gun shootings or, uh, uh, you know, uh, other, other violent, violent activities. And Conspiracy theories are problematic when they like are not true and are giving people an explanation for something that happened by saying there's a conspiracy of of uh, actors in the background. But on the other hand, sometimes there's a conspiracy of actors in the background, right? That are uh, that that are doing things, and sometimes it's a conspiracy of love and goodness, right? It's a coalition of people working mm -hmm. together, and they want to be public and they want it to be out there. And it seems to me the difference between a conspiracy and a coalition is: do you want people to know about it? Like if you're covering it up, and you don't want people to find out that you exchanged emails and phone calls and you had meetings and you did things, mm -hmm. well, that's a conspiracy, right? Because you're and and you're trying to do something nefarious. You're trying to do something harmful versus people doing something positive. So we all know that, yeah, like people join together in lobbying groups and action groups. They function in the world. But then there's something more nefarious that goes on in the background to try to get people to believe something that's not true or that they wouldn't otherwise believe if they had other information, right? Feels to me, and we just talked two days ago with a conspiracy, somebody who specializes in conspiracy theories and mm -hmm. trying to understand what these are. And I was thinking a lot about this conversation, right? Because what you've exposed is, well, there were people with very direct interests, financial interests, worldview interests, uh, personal grudges, you know, uh, that all can, that all came together to say, let's move public opinion among faith voters and faith leaders so that they oppose climate change. Do, do I sort of have that right? Like, is that, is that a, a, a decent explanation mm -hmm. about, about what went on? And you all aren't like, like, like when you're a documentary, so I guess Catherine and, and Jeanine, this is for you as documentary filmmakers, you must be thinking all the time, like, how do you tell the truth of a story? Because as documentarians, you want to expose the truth of a situation to people. In this age of like heightened concern about conspiracy theories and power of, you know, of, of that narrative in, in our society, do you think about that? Do you worry about that? Uh, did that impact how you told this story of the mm -hmm. last 25 years and how this particular issue was shifted and changed? I would say we think about that all the time. Um, and certainly the stories that we have, you know, been able to tell and this one in particular, I think that's why we were so happy to use that Mark Twain quote, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, it only rhymes, because the same kind of uh, actions, the same kind of trying to control the narrative, but if you ground it in kind of a historical and entertaining, you know, like this has happened before, you know, this isn't. 
this isn't a brand new uh, nefarious conspiracy from outer space. This is a kind of a well-known playbook. It's like Curtis said, while the early uh, players, you know, in the oil industry were supporting the, you know, pushing against science because they were also pushing their own Christian worldview, you know, in the early mm -hmm. time that, you know, the very early John P. Rockefellers, you know, not necessarily thinking that they were doing anything, you know, that was going to lead to someone very wisely taking that playbook and applying it directly like a concerted propaganda campaign, um, you know, against that climate science even exists right now. You know, it's just using, you're really talking about the same playbook as Curtis said, is the tobacco industry who went and hired, you know, the best Madison Avenue ad guys they could get and started controlling the narrative. And, mm -hmm. and so when you're a documentarian, hopefully you have, um, you're not just representing one interest. You're trying to include as many voices as like Janine and I, we said, well, we don't know. We need to go out and ask. And so that's why you uh, have all these wonderful, uh, characters in our story who are, you know, we went out and asked them, well, they're in the community that's part of this story. Like, how did this happen? We don't pretend to be the, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the experts on this. We're, we're trying to say, wait, let, let's all look at this and sort of uh, let you decide. Is there something a little, mm -hmm. a little off here? <laughs> All right. So before I, I think, we go down all the routes of what the content was, Curtis, I'm interested in you, you, raise the idea with Catherine and Janine being filmmakers and documentary filmmakers that there's a story to tell here. Why did you want to tell the story in film fashion, especially in this short film, which I think is a great idea. This 20, when I first saw that this was 20 minutes, it was this great relief because I thought when I, when I saw that there was this great documentary <laughs> called God and green and the role of this coming together of faith and, and power brokers, I thought, okay, I'm going to have to like slot an hour and a half into my day, you know, at some point it, it now started to compete with the, like my, I don't know, like my evening entertainment. And when I saw that it was 20 minutes, I literally thought I have 20 minutes right now. So I don't know, within minutes of getting the email, I followed through and clicked on the link, which we'll put in the show notes and all the rest here and, and watched it. And it was something great about it being 20 minutes long. Uh, that, that allowed me to do it. So Curtis, your idea of, I want to tell this story about how the same thing that happened with the tobacco industry now has been happening with faith leaders as a way to deny climate change. Why did you say that that should be told? Th why, why did you think that that should be told through a film and how did you get to 20 minutes? It's both film is both efficient and dense. Um, so it's efficient because it, 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 it doesn't take a long time, right? You can tell a complex story in 20 minutes if you're good at it, uh, like the butlers are. Um, and so that efficiency and the, the density, right? You've got, um, you've got the ability to stack uh, on top of each other uh, image, with the, which is both evocative uh, and instructional. Uh, uh, diagrams and charts and audio. So you, you kind of you're, you're working with a polyphony in film that you don't have in writing. Uh, That's a great you know, word, a, by a the real, way. Polyphony. I've I've never heard that a, word. That is a, a, a real great example of that. Is you know I had read so much trying to understand the um, the 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 housing crash um, in the late zeros, and I just really didn't get it. I'm not an economist, so. There was the kind of limits there, but I heard of this American life story, which basically just followed the money. And it was a narrative form. And I learned more about the entire um, uh, crash than any other piece of writing, um, mm. than, than from any other piece of writing. And I thought, though, there's a lesson right there. So um, as part of what we're interested in is the power of storytelling to convey complex stories with multiple perspectives um, and um, uh, after we saw American Heretics, um, the, the Butler's uh, long form film, we saw in that a, a, a real care to integrate history and uh, mm -hmm. a, a really gripping contemporary um, story, you know, with real meaning for people now. And we thought that's going to be a great way to, to, to do this. Yeah, that's so insightful. Yeah. And, and you chose, the, and, go ahead. 
I, I was just going to say, you said that, you know, documentary filmmakers have a kind of magic that they use. And to me, the what was magic was seeing them um, out of the the many ideas, too many ideas that we brought them and the people that we suggested, they created this really powerful combination of eight primary characters, which I think was a lot for 20 minutes, but it really works mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So tell people where, where, where they can see it. People in the, in the chats are saying, Hey, I'm so anxious to see this. Other people are saying I've watched it. It's on the mm -hmm. website available at the website at the university of Virginia. It's available for free at the religion, race and democracy lab website, religion, race and democracy lab. Yep. And I, I'm sure we can provide you a link. You can post yeah, out yeah, we'll, um, yeah, we'll later too, that. but mm -hmm. Yep. If you we'll keyword religion, race, and democracy lab, Virginia, you'll find it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the film has this animated sense to it. We saw it in the little clip uh, that, that uh, we started with. And that was really a, a, a smart way and sort of a fun way to, to bring these complex, this complex history back together, that there were all of these interweaving stories. Because it's a complicated story over uh, a number of decades that moved faith people into believing that you know this was a problem so so there's a, like there's this sort of um a tale being told which i thought was 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 really interesting uh Catherine Jean, you want to talk a little bit about that that decision to use kind of animation and and uh and the like to to move the story along through through the history um sure i'll take that one uh one we we produced this at the beginning of, not the beginning, I guess, we were in, we started to be in production during the first half of the pandemic. Mm. Um, so we, we knew that, and so our interviews, um, I should do a shout out to all of our characters that they were willing to set up a camera that our DP sent to them and, and like get, get sort of film themselves. And, and, and I would talk to them through zoom and that's how our interviews were done. And then we knew also that, we'd be relying on stock and archival footage, but also um, we thought animation would be a great way to bring yeah. some of these stories up. And we we have this, you know, this amazing team, our an, our animator with the paintings and stuff is Fun Jacket and our editor, Jamie Godfrey, they really work together to, you know, just bring, bring, bring these concepts to life. And Jamie, our, our editor always likes to call some of Drew's work from Fun Jacket. He's got little Easter eggs hidden in his, his animation and paintings. And if you watch it a few times or you stop, you start seeing little messages that he embeds in his work that might relate to an oil drill or environmental justice issues or fires caused by, um, you know, global warming. And so we have a lot of fun with it. And, and, and I just encourage people that if you are, if you do want to watch it, like take some time and really look at some of that artwork because it's, it's just, um, they're very clever. And mm -hmm. it's, it's what goes to what Curtis was saying, where you can with, with film, you can add all these layers. So you can be telling stories on top of the story with mm -hmm. your, not just with the images that you're using, but within the artwork, with the music that you choose, you're sort of, it's, it's kind of like all the ingredients that go into a cake. And, um, and so the animation for us was a lot of fun. It was fun to create and watch it come together. And well, it's a, it's a really powerful way to tell the, to, to tell the story. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the story itself. What, what happened? I, I had thought and this documentary helped me a lot that, well, what happened was Al Gore came out and said, the environment's a problem. <laughs> You know, environmental <laughs> change is a problem. And uh, there was a big movement against Democrats and by uh, Republicans. And so many religious people identify first as a Republican and then later uh, politically in any other way. And so it just became a red versus blue fight. Uh, and I kind of thought, well, that's the best explanation. And and that is an explanation that's in there, right? But But it's not the only explanation, which I think is the powerful part of this story is it wasn't just individual uh, people being moved because of political sideism. 
it was uh, so so. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that, and then we can talk about some of the other factors that that the characters exposed about what was going on with this. There was just a political, a bare knuckled political, like, hey, we're going to use environment as a as a wedge issue for voters. Um, Curtis, what, what what was going on with that? As you've looked at religion in America and its its power, what 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 went into making well, the decision? Well, there's a funny sense the in which. Um, climate the climate issue was a a little bit along for the ride along with a host of other um uh dividing line issues Mm. um um, civil union um uh, abortion uh right to take the more kind of local personal interpersonal issues um um and um you know, perspectives on property ownership, uh, perspectives right. on regulation, right? The more kind of so- social, communal things. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we really found fascinating was that um, it, it it wasn't always like it is now, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be like it is now. But you, And mm-hmm. the film starts out so wonderfully with those two ads with um, Pelosi and Gingrich and Sharpton and Buchanan, right? It's like this was not a divisive issue um, for at least for that moment, right? Um, um, not exclusively a divisive issue, right? That happens several years later when it really becomes bundled um, with uh, you know larger moral majority issues and it really becomes a way one of one of a host of issues to bind together um, mm-hmm. Uh, dedicated Republican voting groups. Um, and, and so it's that transformation in the later 2000s that we were really interested in, in terms of present history. Um, but yeah, when there's was a longer that campaign story. put out, yeah. that, that, yeah. that campaign of, hey, we're on different that's sides two, politically? That's 2008, 2009, and you see by the 2014, the early teens, right, that it's just right yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. i mean so god really controls sh- the climate right yes there's nothing really in we short can, order nothing like, we can do about this that. was yeah. this wasn't one of these like 40 years it took to to make this shift somewhere between 2008 nope. and 2009 and 2014 yeah. which people that follow politics and say that was also mm-hmm. the time of the tea party takeover like there was a whole mm-hmm. thing inside of republicanism that that went on and mm-hmm. that tea party tended to come movement came out of certain states and you only touch on this a little bit, but like oil drilling states, right? It came out of mm-hmm. you know Oklahoma and Texas and and places mm-hmm. where there were powerful interests that thought a lot about the future of the oil industry, and and that's the other piece of it, right? That oil and people that had investment in oil that were also religious, and that was the piece that was so revolutionary or, or uh, revealing to me is that there were these like just rich powerful oil operating families that just also happened to be religious in a very conservative kind of religious religious way and like every citizen in the country they want to influence you know with the power that they have so they had money and they had oil industry and that kind of came together in this weird mashup where they needed to create a theology that went along with their business practice you know not very reminiscent of how the you know, Christians in the South in the United States in the 1850s had to create a religion and a religious argument for slavery that produced a new kind of race theory and how God would divide the races and so on because they had a business model that needed justification. So the capitalism side said to the church, we need to re-understand our theology of, you know, humanity to do so. And it seemed to me, and Curtis, you're, you're the expert on this, but it seemed to me that this was also something that was going on uh, in this movement in the sort of middle 2000s, that there was an aggressive theological reconsideration being put together to explain why extracting oil from the ground is the best way for us to continue to function our democracy and our capitalism. Yeah, well, the, the, the expert on that story, which is a, that's actually a longer term story is a fellow named Darren Dochuk, uh, who's a professor of history at the, uh, at Notre Dame. And he's one of the characters in the film. And, Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I think pr probably every character we we have a lot more interview tape and we wanted to include more, yeah. right? That's a part of the, the tragedy of creating something like this. But don't forget what you guys did do mm. on at the lab mm. was on mm. your website, you can read the full interviews um, mm -hmm. from, oh. from, from our characters. So you can get a little yeah. more in depth, but also with mm -hmm. his, he, he wrote a book called anointed, mm. anointed with oil, anointed. That's I think right. it's anointed with oil. And mm. um, it, it really, it's fascinating read. I mean, it's just it's fascinating. Great. Yeah. It's really good in terms of okay. if you're really interested in that particular area of the conversation. So you start to an see... answer to your question. Yeah, go ahead. The, 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 you know, he, what um, Darren Dochuk does is he, he charts two tales. One is the rise of a oil and a kind of the creation of a civil religion. Um, and the other is um, uh, uh, oil uh, that he calls wildcat Christianity, w yeah. which is much more about um, um, uh, l local authority, uh, uh, you know, laced with the distrust of uh, of big government, right? and those two play off each other for the better part of the the twentieth century. And wildcat Christianity comes to have a, a real kind of cultural emotional hold over. Mm -hmm. Um, da uh, Darren Dochuk would say over evangelicals today. Yeah, mm -hmm. that yeah. That that was such an provocative ethos, phrase. Yeah. Yes, right. And yeah. and that is still yeah. what it, I mean. That that shows up, you know, t literally today. The the documentary says this is a tale of what happened, you know, uh, in the past, uh, mm -hmm. what's happening now, what's happening in the future. And man, that that version of Christianity. Um, that you know he refers to as the as a wildcat, which is a, a phrase you know in, in, in mm -hmm. that, that comes from the, from industry, and that is what's happening. That there's this like mm -hmm. wild west renegade kind of capitalism, you know, that's fueled on by an Ayn Rand kind of libertarianism for people that are into the political theories. They kind of get behind all this, and that crowd just wanted there to be no hum no regulation on human interaction when it came to providing for our capitalism right <laughs> like don't, yeah. don't don't restrain just mm -hmm. just be free and that meant free fr and and they you know obviously you know these the kind of republicanism that is pushed for freedom from government on all things that that has been around our american our american um uh, worldview for a long long time but it got mixed with a kind of civil religion as you mentioned it curtis and a kind of like christian nationalism that feels like it created a, a new variant. It, it almost feels like when we talk about the, the coronavirus, that there's these, there's these new variants that come out that the vaccine might not be as, as potent against. Like we have <laughs> vaccines in our society to prevent certain strains from having its power. And a new variant came in the middle 2000s in this thinking, this kind of virus in our thinking that just took just spread like um, like like a virus around went viral, right? And and got into all kinds of thinking that that all of a sudden people were saying just things about the environment that was um, seemed wacky. Now I will say this, and I'd be interested in your thoughts. There's also people who say on the climate change and the climate uh, uh, um, the, and and the environment needs to be a top issue in our society. There's a kind of apocalyptic world that gets talked about in that, in that realm too, right? For the people that view the, the, the environment the way that I do, you know, sort of on my progressive side of this, that I think spooks a lot of people, right? Where they just talk about, you know, there was peak oil and there's going to be a crashing of the economy and there was going to be the, the you know, we're going to lose the world. We're going to, the, the human race will not survive. Like there's a strong apocalyptic narrative, right? And it felt to me like what happened was religious people like to talk about apocalypse and they don't want other people stepping on their territory. <laughs> and so now there were competing apocalyptic narratives uh, that, that were happening. <laughs> D did you get any of that? Like, I know you interviewed some people that did, you know, they said like, hey, I was a climate denier and now I'm not. And one person was a congressman. Um, but but is, is there anything in that, that, that the, the, pro the environment is in crisis crowd also change tack in this same period of time in a way that that also caused to some of this increased division 
Oh, gosh, that's a very interesting question. I think it it's complicated, but I think the um, I think the overriding theme and please you guys jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that the distrust of what's called as the elites, mm -hmm. the sort of natural distrust that's always been kind of in that kind of wildcat, you know, uh, what else what to do, distrust of authority, distrust of institutions, plays really nicely with the apocalyptic narrative as well. And I think that that really has gotten amped up. You know, um, they you know specifically went after the the early climate science scientists on their data, and they were kind of throwing epithets at them as that they were just snobbish elites that were trying to control. And this isn't true because God, God creates the climate. God controls the climate. What do they know there? So I think it's very complicated. But the distrust, that sort of core tenet of distrust, has been kind of using your viral, has been an immense booster. <laughs> <You know? laughs> nice. Running, nice. You know, whatever kind of theory there might be. Yeah, I, I agree with Kath. I think, you know, and from the people, the, the experts that do that, that, that think about this and study this, that we came away um, from them with the message of maybe not it's competition for the apocalyptic narrative, but it in, in certain in certain areas, it was also about man's hubris, like the arrogance of the scientists, the arrogance of the elites to think that that man could control the climate because, you know, as the guy in the film says at the top, you know, God controls the climate. And that and and maybe while the leadership might not have believed that, that was something that they were able to organize and sort of feed to their flocks and the masses and kind of gin up that distrust that Catherine talked about um, or the separation. Um, and I think the other thing to remember, and it doesn't as much have to do with the apocalyptic, is one thing that we keep getting reminded of is that it was also about organizing a committed block of voters to have a very big influence and voice at the at the voting booth. Um, and while that might be diminishing a little in, from, in terms of the religious right, it might be diminishing a little bit, it's still worth remembering that um, these conversations, these ideas about bundling envi the environment into some of the larger issues or even the wedge issues that, that, that wanted to be voted on was just sort of a brilliant strategy among leadership who wanted certain things not to happen mm. on the political front, deregulation, things like that. Um, and so, I mean, I like your concept of the apocalypse. Nobody wants to, you know, this is our apocalyptic narrative. Maybe that's something we should research further. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that God's going to destroy the world. We're not going to destroy the world. Right? That's, God's, that's, that's God's doing. It, I think it really does drive a lot of the, I don't, not, not the facts or anything, but it kind of the, um, the deep down sense of that human beings are, um, only have so much power. I mean, I, I think I heard video of Rush Limbaugh saying stuff like that in the 2000s, right? Like, who do you think you are that you could control, you know, the, the, the planet's been around for millions of years and, and you know, what we're going to do in six years, 10 years is not enough to make, make change. And then climate scientists are like, no, let us show you about, you know, the, the, the rising temperatures and, and how we made changes to our to our policies and to our regulations and the ozone layer uh, that was a problem 30 and 40 years ago is not the same kind of problem now. Like we can literally make changes in what we do as human beings and that has impact uh, on the planet. And, 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 and it's just, a, it's a, such a curious thing. I haven't been a working pastor for so many years. Like the environment feels overwhelming to people right that, that like as a topic and the idea that like what i'm going to do is like turn the water off when i'm brushing my teeth and that's going to it the the interventions that a human being can do you know or i'm going to take the bus instead of my car or i'm going to change out my light bulbs to a more efficient kind feels like oh you got to be kidding me like that's going to be the answer um 
and so I, I don't know, there seems like there's something in the environmental call to human being, to human engagement that feels, that I can see that feeds into someone thinking, that's not really how this, this changes. <laughs> like that's, that's mm-hmm. not going to be enough. Uh, I, I sure hope that's not it. Um, and so I think there's kind of a, I don't know, a sense of uh, people feeling really disempowered. And so if someone can come along and give you a, a narrative that says, yeah, don't worry about it. It's not you. Like you're not the problem in this, in this scenario. Right. It's that's, brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's kind of a smart, smart play. T- tell us the story about the congressman. He's, it's, it's such a fun story, and I think people will want to will hear this one. Who, who wants to recap the, the congressman who said, I'm totally against the environment and didn't know anything about it? I think Janine, because she had a great conversation with Bob. And I... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so Bob Inglis was a, um, decided that it's at one point, I mean, he sort of says it himself. He says, you know, I always voted against climate change. I, you know, that's nonsense. All I knew was Al Gore was for it. So I'm against it. And he said, and then I went to run for a second time. I was very successful. And my son came to me and said, dad, I'm with you. I support you. I'm all I'll back this all the way, except for one thing, you have got to change your stance on, on climate change. You know, basically I'm sure he said to him, cause you know, it's my future that you're messing with. So you better find out a little bit more about this. And so he did. And he went, I think, where did he, he went to the Arctic and he saw the glaciers melting and what's up? And he met barrier, some, right? the Great Barrier Reef, as well, right? And he went to the Great Barrier Reef and he saw that the um, the reef was bleaching and he really had an epiphany and he did his homework and he came back and he introduced um, bills, right, in Congress. And he said, you know, I believe climate change is real and this is how I think we can tackle it. And in the primary that he was running for, he, he got stomped. He just lost completely to <laughs> yeah, right. his right. adversary, right? <laughs> Like he and, was in a super safe district as a Republican exactly, and then he got primaried yeah. and lost Went from like 80% support or something. Wasn't it like, didn't he win like yeah. 80% and then he got it like was, 30%. It was terrible. And terrible. as he says, it was a spectacular face plant. Like he in politics, he just, and, and, but beyond that, and some of the stuff that's not in the, in the, didn't make it into the short, but is in the interview. Um, he was, ostracized and excoriated and his family received, you know, nasty messages. And it just, he was turned on so quickly and so viciously that Mm. he's very brave because in a lot of ways, maybe somebody else would have said, all right, I'm done, but he didn't, he became like the biggest advocate for sensible legislation as he sees it for climate change and kept pushing forward on carbon taxes and things like that. Um, and, and now it's interesting with the political environment that we're seeing today, cause we're seeing a little bit of that, but he's still, you know, in terms of like, if you, you know, if you buck the trend of your party, then you're in trouble, but he did it before it was uh, popular in the environmental movement. So, so that's his story. And, and he's, he really, he continues to work for, um, environmental education and climate change. And, and his story is told as a bit of a cautionary tale. And it was, it was a famous story when it, when that all happened, I can't remember what years that was 2012 or 14, somewhere in there. I can't remember uh, either. So, somewhere in there because people the those of us who were working <laughs> on like trying to get Republican faith voters to move on the environment as one of the ways to sort of soften their opposition to so many things that seem so important. Um, it was like, well, there's a congressman who who lost his seat to, you know, he got primaried and everyone's worried about that. Right. That someone more on the on the on the political right, someone more conservative than you is going to primary you. And on the political left with many Democrats, that's someone uh, more progressive than you is going to is going to make a run at you. And and that is a real concern, right? Like they're they're really worried about this. And people saw those tea leaves and said, we're not going to get on the wrong side of of the environment and, and at least not use the language and not talk about it in that way. So I, I hear I hear a lot of people saying things now around uh, politicians around environment that 
yes, we believe in climate change, mm -hmm. but we don't think it's human caused climate change, right? That it's part of the secular mm -hmm. pattern that goes on. And then they talk about ice ages and like, this is just a thing that happens and we have to respond to it. But what we don't need to do is to blame it on human beings and then to put in regulation. We, we don't need to constrain human beings because of natural developments. Is, is that right? Is that what you heard from as you did this as you did this work, that that's become the compromise that certain religious people and especially um, Republicans are, are trying to push? That, that they can get on sort of the right side of the science without being on the human influence side of the of the issue? Well, that's, I think it's a generational issue as well, because I think that is true, Doug. Um, but the, um, we, we also interviewed a really lovely group, um, really committed of young evangelicals for environmental action. And they have no problem with pushing back and saying no. And they're getting involved on the community level where these decisions are being mm -hmm. made. They're involved on the national level. Uh, in Washington, um, and even uh, you know Bob, you know former Congressman Bob Inglis, you know he st he goes you know community to community. They all feel like from the grassroots level that science is solid, and everybody in their communities can see that their crops are changing or their gardens are you know getting slammed by weird freezes. You know everybody knows something's going on, but. So they're they're trying to take it back. So the younger generation, I think, mm. is pushing back. But what is the old chestnut that politics is, is it twenty years behind the national mm. conversation? Time machine, yeah. But we don't really have that time, right? Yeah. We do not have that time, you know, at this juncture. Um, so that's, I think, the an important part that was we tried to make sure was in in the story as well. Yeah. And, and that was helpful. I, I'm so glad that, you know, the, the young, younger organized evangelicals, environmentalists are, are out in the world. I, maybe I'm just becoming an old crotchety person, but mm -hmm. I don't trust that generationalism is going to solve these problems. Right. Cause had that been the case, uh, I think the hippie <laughs> movement and, you know, we, we launched the environmental protection agency in like 1972, right. There was a whole young move, young movement supporting yeah. this stuff. And, uh, you know, it all got sold out during the 1980s and then again in the middle 2000s. So, um, and, and there's, so I, I wish hope that, um, there's just going to be generational change to make these things happen, but boy, it feels like there's got to be some better arguments um, and better engagement. Um, did, did you leave this whole project thinking, uh, and Curtis, I'm interested in your thoughts on this. Do you think the religious narrative around the environment and climate uh, has has a chance to be different in 10 years than it is, than it is now? Oh, oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, we saw how quickly things changed in the, in the 2000s. Um, so we know that um, belief and sentiment can change very quickly. Um, you know, outside of the film, well, okay, within the film, uh, I, I think the stories of Bob, in Bob Inglis and also uh, Richard Sizik, um, leader in the National Association of Evangelicals for a long time, are instructive. Um, and, you know, they kind of characterize it as a conversion experience, but I might almost call it a social experience. They met scientists, and mm -hmm. if I can extrapolate a little bit, extrapolate a little bit, they realized that they were regular people, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, one of the takeaways for me uh, is that it's just it's good to spend some time with sciences with, with scientists. Um, you know, there there are many people of faith who are science scientists, and um, they, you know, what what they do that's distinctive is they they have a different sense of time in relationship to the earth, um, you know, and most scientists are very careful about the kind of claims they make uh, and uh, and the kind of data that they use to make those claims. You know, so for instance, I, I spent some time a couple of years ago in Yellowstone in the winter. Um, and, and one of the things that they've tracked is how many days of winter there are um, and, and th th over the course of more than a century's worth of data, we're now looking at about 60 days less uh, of winter. 
at that high elevation. Um, wow. You know, that's a that that that's something that you you don't really get a, a lived sense of, and unless you're spending time with scientists in places that they know mm -hmm. and they care about, and then it becomes a real human issue that you can have a conversation about, right? Um, and I think that's important. And you know, one of the great things that the internet has brought, I think, is better access to better public access to science. Like, go hang out with um, bird watchers who are knowledgeable about yeah. uh, you know the history of the migrations in their region, right? And, and it'll it'll impact the way you think about our impact on our places. Yeah, so, and that kind of human to human conversation can change the narratives that we live by. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how important did your, did this, uh, did your documentary give you any insight into how important like leadership is on this stuff? Like, is it, are there, did it become clear to you that there are people who could really lead out and make a difference to sway important public opinion one direction or the other? Or does it feel more like, no, this is many voices. This is going to take a lot of, uh, of streams coming together to form a river. And, and it's, we don't really need to find individual leaders to advocate we need a crowdsourced kind of movement do you, do you have a sense about that from from the work on the documentary i i think from my perspective it is a many source crowd you know crowdsource many voices um, i think the voices that we showcased um that we've already discussed are reverend mariama who is bringing the environmental justice component to this um, I, I think this is just such a large, large thing that we're facing. Yeah. It could possibly be one leader. Um, and, 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 and they all say it's coming, going to come from the grassroots of community. Yeah. Um, we can't, you know, because everybody knows how they're affected. And so if there's a vessel or a platform where these all, all these voices can be mm you know, stand together, you know, I think she says in the end, you know, because there is a lot of interfaith, uh, you know, coalitions who are very much not just the young evangelicals, but, you know, in every faith, and you have Pope Francis with his message, you know, about, you know, the yeah. encyclical on the environment. And um, so it's, if there was just some way to bring them together in one platform, and maybe there already is, I'm not sure. We were we were trying to create that platform with this short piece as well to show all the yeah. different diversity of voices. But, uh, but I, I do think too, that we have to like, the, it, all those voices in the communities have to come together. Right? But then for, but it's a global issue from a leadership right. point of view. Yeah. If, 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 if we in the United States can't, take that leadership role and take back that leadership role and move forward with all the other nations that are, are pushing forward, then, I mean, it, that has to, it has to happen too. Cause it's mm -hmm. just, it's a, it's, it's bigger than us. Yeah, it, but that doesn't just, mean it has to be overwhelming or scary because it can change. Like we can change this. We can do this. Right. You know it. And we've been talking about it for so long, right? You know, and I know there's a lot of things we talk about, right? We talk about uh, pollution versus climate change, and that's that's different than, you know, th those are different issues. So some people are very committed to pollution, but they don't really think about climate change. Some people are really into, like, we have to change uh, our federal government and big corporations' use of fossil fuels and of plastics, because if you don't do that, the individual consumption is just not enough to turn the corner and mm -hmm. some people are really into like gas emissions like like there's just a lot of areas this is the, the, talking about the environment you know it's like talking about science it's an it's an area of study it's not a, mm -hmm. it's not a singular thing you know religion's the same way it's not just one thing it's it's all of these coming together and it, it i just hope that we're like it felt like there was a movement in the early 2000s that felt like okay we're gonna really tackle these these issues and then people would argue about the best means of tackling that and you know is it going to be wind or solar as an alternative or is it going to be hydro you know all this stuff that are like yeah that's really an interesting way like what's the way forward and then something feels like it changed and if people want to know what that is 
the uh, God in Green uh, documentary is a essential piece uh, to understanding how, how religious communities and big money and oil uh, all came together in some common purposes. And, and uh, unlike a conspiracy theory, it wasn't a secret. They, they, they did this stuff right out in public, right? I mean, unbelievable. The hubris uh, of just like, oh no, we're going to, uh, we're, we're not only going to say it out loud, we're going to, we're going to shout it from the rooftops. That's a fascinating piece of this of this whole story. So thank you to all f- three of you and all the others who worked on this project. Any uh, any final words for the good people about uh, about this topic or about this this documentary? Go, uh, Curtis. Please tune in and see it. Yes, we'll yeah, watch yeah, it. <laughs> please, please see it, and and we'll m- make sure that um, uh, vote common good listeners and viewers ha- have easy access to the film. And there's some other resources there that are available too. And if you have questions and comments, uh, uh about it, you know, feel free to contact us, uh, and, um, uh, let's keep the conversation going. That's what we made the film for too. Uh, well, great. That's so, uh, that's Kurt Schaefer. Conversation. You can find out all yeah. the good things going on in the. I, I think this is such a fascinating uh, a center that you run, the Religion, Race, and Doc, and uh, Democracy Center. Um, I had dem- documentary and democracy mixed up in my brain there, um, <laughs> uh, and they used a documentary to talk about religion, race, and democracy, and, and that's great. And uh, Catherine and Janine make great films. If you haven't seen American Heretics yet, you should. And if you haven't uh, watched that's this right. film yet, you'll be glad that you did. Uh, Catherine, Jean, are you working on anything else that we need to keep our our a slot in our documentary watching uh, schedule open for? Do you have something coming in the future? We'll let you know. Fingers crossed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, the Constitution and the rise of police power, um, based on a little known 16th century English law that is uh, kind of the basis of, of uh, this, uh, the unregulated use in which uh, basically anybody can be arrested at any time for any reason. So we are working hard to bring that one to the screen. Well, thank you. That's uh, that's another important topic. You guys do great work. Well, thanks all for uh, for being yeah. with us here on the Vote Common Good Daily Podcast. Tomorrow, our f- uh, Friday with astrophysicist Paul Wallace, where we talk about uh, common good science. So a great lead in from this topic into uh, into all things science. And, and be sure to subscribe. And if you have any messages for us, you can send a note over to podcast at votecommongood.com. So uh, Curtis, Catherine, Janine, thanks again for being for being on with us today. Thank, thank you, you Doug. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah.